The talk today is C++ feature coroutines beginner friendly. The first part I think is all right. The second one makes this talk quite hard, all right? Um, you are free to judge me later. Um, if you intended to see this talk from the beginning, you may have noticed two changes. The first one is um, this talk is no longer happening on Tuesday. It's Wednesday now, right? And um, the second one is this talk now is 90 minutes instead of just 60. I explain you the reasons in a moment. I'm Andreas Fertig, and um, my last name and myself, I am German. And the translation into English of my last name, which is an adjective, is finished, ready, complete, or completed. So you can do awesome things with this name. Um, it occurs quite frequent in the German language because there are a lot of things where you say you're basically fertig, you're ready, you're done, you're finished. Sad part is adjectives are spelled lowercase in German. And as a name, it's spelled with a capital F. So I have a constant fighting with the spell checker, which one is right when. And um, it's, we are never agreeing on these two things. I'm not sure whether this goes the same for English, but um, I realized once again that the last name also has a different meaning depending on how I'm saying it um, in relation to the sentence. So I can, for example, say, I'm fertig, which means, well, I'm, I'm, I'm done with some tasks I did and I'm happy about it. I can also say, oh, I'm fertig which means I'm more like exhausted and I'm done and I'm good with that. And today it's the latter. So <laughs> the reason why this talk got upgraded and shifted is, well, if you ever want to have a 90 minute talk on a conference, then the best way is to submit a 90 minute talk obviously on a conference. There is at least a side path not a one I recommend, okay, but it's a possible one. You submit a 60-minute talk, that one gets accepted. You're flying to the conference, you get sick. So you call the conference and tell them, you might not be able to give your talk on the planned date. They happily agree to shift your talk to a day later to give you more time to recovery. You later check the schedule again, see, oh yeah, your talk got moved to the latest possible slot. Awesome great conference, close the notebook, think, oh, you have to know when exactly the talk happened, so you get to the notebook back again, look at it, see, oh yeah, it's, it's 1.30, perfect. Wasn't that to 3 o'clock? So you open the laptop again, see, oh yeah, it's until 3 o'clock. You're not fit as usual, so it takes some time to realize, oh, it's 90 minutes and not 60 anymore. Try to find a break or something. No, it's a 90-minute talk now. So um, this is how you get upgraded to a 90-minute talk. It doesn't necessarily speak for me. It's, it's more the illness that came along. Um, but the good thing is um, I made this one a 90-minute talk. So let's see how we can do with coroutines in 90 minutes, all right? The first thing to start with is the difference between functions that we all know and coroutines. For a function, we have the well-known control flow. We have a caller that places a call to a function. Then this function runs to whatever point, either to the very end of the function or something in the middle, and then the function returns. And that means it gives control back to the caller, but it also means that the entire state of the function gets destroyed, okay? The stack gets basically given back to the next caller. So, you, of course, can call the function again and again, but it always starts with zero knowledge. Say it like that. This is the usual flow, and it's, it's good for a lot of things. I mean, C++ survived um, without coroutines for 30 years or so, so obviously it works without coroutines. If you look at coroutines, then we have a caller that places a call to a coroutine. Now, this coroutine runs, and a coroutine has now the ability to be suspended and resumed. 
So sometimes you also see the term resumable functions, so maybe suspendable functions. And this is because of this behavior of a coroutine. So a coroutine can do more than simply returning. It can also yield values out of the coroutine, and it can wait, await for values sent <coughs> into the coroutine. And these are so-called suspension points. So whenever the coroutine does this, it can give up control to the caller, but it still preserves the current state, which is awesome, which is the power of a coroutine. So if we look at the control flow at the right, so there we have our caller that places a call to the coroutine. The coroutine runs for a while, and then it co-yields. So with C++20, we got, among other things, three new keywords. That's co-yield, that's co-weight, and co-return. And we need all these three for coroutines. So here I'm using co-yield and co-return. So my coroutine co-yields control back to the caller. Now the con caller might get a result. It can process that one. It resumes its control flow, and at some point, it invokes the coroutine again, the same coroutine. So that one gets resumed, continues where it was left off, does some work, yields control back to the caller. Caller does something, calls the coroutine one final time again, and finally the coroutine co-returns, giving control back essentially to the caller and destroys its state more or less like it's for a function. And this pausing and resuming, this is the power of a coroutine. And that's the difference, the main difference to a usual function. Now a couple of, of definitions um, first. So the term coroutine itself, it's not new. It may be new to C++, but it's well established in computer science since it was first coined in 1958 by Melvin Conway. Among programming languages, coroutines come in two different forms of flavors. Um, you will see stack full or stack less coroutines. The behavior, the coroutine can yield control back to the caller and preserve its entire state. That's no magic. It means this state is saved somewhere. And this somewhere is either on a dedicated stack or on some piece of heap. So if you are talking about stack full coroutines, it means that the state gets stored on the stack somewhere, usually a dedicated piece of stack. If you are talking about state stackless coroutines, that means we are using the heap for the coroutine information. And this information is usually called the coroutine frame. This is where all your function local variables as well as the parameters end up with. So they are not placed on the stack as normally, they end up with this coroutine frame. And this is, in the case of C++, stored on the heap. Okay, so every coroutine, once you create it, causes a dynamic memory allocation to the heap. You can somehow try to avoid it at least to some parts, but not entirely. The other thing is, um, when it comes to coroutines and um, concurrency, you will often also hear cooperative multitasking as a term, which is something we can use when we are using coroutines. And I will show you um, more about this later. In general, we can say that coroutines can simplify your code. Um, they can help us to replace, for example, function pointers, aka callbacks, once we are using coroutines. Of course, we simply can return the result once it's there. Um, it can make your code that you have to write for parsing data way more easy, more readable. I have an example for that also uh, later in the talk. The main fact of that, I, I personally think, is that the state machine we us usually have to write for all this stuff is now what the coroutine does for us. because it knows where it left off, it can simply continue. And without the help of coroutines, we have to write this entire state maintenance ourselves, which, well, makes the code bigger and sometimes harder to read. But these are these things. I told you we have three new keywords, co-yield, co-weight, and co-return, to pause and resume coroutines. Co-yield or co-weight, Pause a coroutine. 
That means if you put it in table, you can say that who yield here is an output action. Its purpose is to give a value to the caller, from the coroutine to the caller, like a return, with the only difference that you still can resume the coroutine later. The coroutine state usually is suspended at this point, so it means it doesn't continue. It gives the value to the caller. We also have coreturn that also is an output action. The difference is the coroutine is now ended, so it's like if you're returning from a function, and you should never invoke a function that coreturn. This is undefined behavior. So it's a special state in, in coroutines which you do not have for regular functions, um, but for coroutines, once a coroutine is returned, it's done. So don't invoke it again. And then we have um, the third keyword that's cool wait. This is an input action. So this is how your coroutine can await for more data from the outside. A rough model could be seen like parameters passed to functions. Okay, so the difference here, because your function can be paused and resumed, is we now also have a way to feed in values again into this function. So like putting parameters to it again. And for cool weight, usually the state always uh, also is suspended once you say cool weight here. Then we have the elements of a core team. I know we haven't looked at C++ code yet, but we will. Um, this is theory first. In C++, a coroutine consists basically at least of two things. Something that I call a wrapper type. And this is the return type of your coroutine's function's prototype. Okay, if you look at the coroutine and you compare it to a regular function, you see the return type. And this return type, this is what I call here the wrapper type. Because this wrapper type allows us to control the coroutine from the outside. Once the coroutine runs, well, we need a way into the coroutine to put data in, to get data out, some things like that, um, pausing or assuming the coroutine. And this can be done with a so-called coroutine handle. So every coroutine comes with a handle, like if you are allocating memory and you have a pointer to that thing. And this wrapper type now can encapsulate all these things. So it knows the coroutine handle if you teach it to. It knows how to resume and to suspend the coroutine. It knows what data this coroutine might provide. So this is our wrapper type, our access to the coroutine. And the second ingredient is the compiler looks for type with the exact name promise type as spelled on this slide inside the return type of the coroutine. So inside our wrapper type. Okay, this is how the system works. So we have the wrapper type, this is the return type of our coroutine, and we know inside that has to be something that's called promise type. And this something can either be directly a type in the form of a struct or a class, uh, a type alias, a type def, things like that. So it must be a type in the end, and this promise type here, this is the, I would say, biggest thing that makes uh, coroutines in C++ so interesting, because this allows us to customize the coroutine with customization points. This promise type is what a compiler looks at to decide how we want to shape our coroutine. We have two more parts of a coroutine that are somewhat optional depending on what you want to model. So the first two you basically need. Um, the third one is an awaitable type, which comes into play when you use core weight. So if you have a coroutine that doesn't core weight, you don't need that part. And the fourth part is because coroutines basically implement an infinite stream of, of values of data, so you, you could technically use a coroutine to receive a TCP data stream, you don't know really when it ends, um, maybe only when the connection is terminated. So one thing that we often see together with coroutines is that we loop over the data. 
And that means that another ingredient of coroutines are often iterators. So we write iterators for our coroutines to make them usable in range-based for loops. Okay, but that's just making it nice for our users. It's not really an requirement. The coroutine itself you can see as a finite state machine, which can be controlled and customized by this promise type. And the actual coroutine function then uses co-yield, co-weight, or co-return for communication with the world outside of the coroutine. Okay, so this is just a very fancy compiler-driven finite state machine, which we are talking about here. Now, the next slide makes me very sad, but it has to be there. Um, so first talk, I need a disclaimer. So I'm reading that one out. Um, please note, um, I tried to keep this code that you will see as simple as possible. Focusing on coroutines is the goal here. In production code, I swear to you, I work with way more public and private, as well as potential getters and setters. Okay, additionally, I use way more generic code in production to keep repetition slow, especially with coroutines. But for this talk, um, I decided to do everything a little bit differently to fit it on slides, okay, and to get rid of any distraction that might come from templates. So my goal here is to help you understand coroutines, and I'm very confident that you can improve the code that you will see with the usual C++ best practices, okay? Um, that was not the saddest part. The saddest part is the last one now. I also never ever declare more than one variable per line. I teach that, believe me. Slide code today is the only exception. I didn't find the other way to fit it on one slide that was okay for me. So let's look at C++ code here. This is the first coroutine. We are starting at the top. I have this function fun. And once we start looking into the function, we can see in B the first co yield. So at this moment, we know we are looking at a coroutine. And the second thing we know because of that is that in A, the return type of fun, chat, is the so called wrapper type. We don't know anything about that except that inside chat, there is another type called promise type. Okay, so we know that because we know it's core yielding, it has to be a core routine. Now, if we then look in our core routine, in B here, we have co yield a std string S. So basically, that core routine returns at this point, if you so want, the string hello. Then in C, I'm using co-wait here, awaiting a std string object. I'm not saying anything more than a type here because the way I'm using it, it's fine, and we will see later a little bit more about that. I received that string and immediately print it to C out. And the third part here in D then is that my core routine co-returns here. Okay, so three steps I squeezed co-yield, co-weight, and co-return in one coroutine, that was hard enough. If we then look down in line number 12 in E, I'm calling fun for the first time, storing that one in an object called chat. So this is the setup of the coroutine. So coroutine is a little different to a regular function. There is something like a setup phase, if you call it the first time. I'm doing that here in E. And then in F, I'm invoking the coroutine for the first time by calling chat.listen. Because we haven't seen the type chat yet, we don't know much about it, but obviously I can call listen on it. The next thing I do in G is I'm calling chat.answer and putting a std string to that. And then in H, I call chat.listen again and see how the, the received value here, the received stood string. So if I run this uh, coroutine, the coroutine first will say, hello, and then from the outside I will ask, where are you? And the coroutine will reply, here. So very simple thing, all right? 
but it's chatting. And if you now start looking behind the scenes, this is the promise type I talked about I need for this coroutine. In A here, you can see the tragedy about um, declaring two variables in one line. I decided to do it that way, such that we have a clear picture what's in and out of the coroutine. So in A here, I declared two variables of type std string, msg out, msg in. This is totally free. I can name them any way I want. I can pick any type I want. What comes next in B, this is something that implementation requires. So the compiler looks now for a couple of customization points, all spelled with the same way as spelled on the slide. So the compiler looks for a function called unhandled exception. This way we can control what should happen if a coroutine encounters an exception inside a coroutine. More about that later. Currently, I'm simply saying I'm personally doing nothing here. So let the usual things um, happen, which will be my program terminates at this point. Then we have another function called get return object. Because of this dependency that I have this wrapper type on the outside and the promise type on the inside, they have somewhat like a relation, but the promise type doesn't know anything about the wrapper type. So once the compiler starts creating this coroutine, it only knows about the promise type, but it also has to create the wrapper type, the actual return type of this coroutine. And to let the compiler know how to construct this type, we have this get return object function. So because only we as implementers know how many parameters to pass to the constructor of chat or which values or whatever we want. So get return object here is the first function that the compiler calls for us after the promise type got created to create my wrapper type. And here I'm simply saying, I'm creating a chat object by passing the this point of my promise type. So this way I'm telling the chat object about the promise type. And then we have the functions initial suspend and yield value. So once a coroutine got created, if you see it like a regular function, you can say maybe right after the opening curly brace, the compiler checks for initial suspend. So this is another customization point where we can tell the compiler what to do. Immediately start entering the body of the coroutine or pause here and give control back to the caller, to the creator of the coroutine. And we will see different flavors and when um, what makes sense to us. Yield value then gets called whenever we say co-yield. So all these keywords, co-yield, co-return, co-weight, gets translated by the compiler to calls to the promise type. Okay, So there is no actual co-yield in, in your code anymore later. It gets rewritten to call to yield value. And yield value now is a simple function call. It works with overloads like regular functions. So I can have a yield value here that takes a std string by copy as I do. I can have one that takes a std string by reference, by const reference, by R value, and so forth. And I can also have different yield values if my coroutine can handle that, where one handles a std string, the other one handles an integer, things like that. I only have the std string version here, yield value taking a std string by value, storing it in MSG out, and yield value as initial suspend now returns always false, suspend always false. This is a new type in the standard library together with suspend never that signals the compiler whether to pause execution here and give control back to the caller or let it resume the coroutine. Okay, we will see these types um, in I think a couple of slides. The next function we have here as a customization point is await transform. Await transform kicks in when I say co-await. Okay, this is the function that gets dispatched there. So this is why I didn't need to say anything special about this stud string. It's just function overloading, so I need some way 
to trigger this function. So I say it's a std string I'm awaiting here. And inside this await transform, I picked up a habit there. Um, usually I do not declare structs inside functions, but for these awaiters, it seems all right to do it. So what I'm doing here in H, I'm declaring a struct awaiter. That one stores internally a reference to my promise type. And it declares the three functions await ready, await resume, and await suspend. These functions are more customization points for the compiler where it checks what to do next. And these functions are what suspend always or suspend never provide for us, just with default values. What I'm doing here is I'm saying await ready is always true. Await resume tracks out the MSGN value and returns it. So this is when the coroutine gets resumed, how it gets the value from the outside world. Okay, because I'm feeding it back, I'm returning it here. And for my await suspend, currently for this coroutine, I don't have anything to do. It takes a coroutine handle of type void and it doesn't do anything. Next, in line 22, I'm creating a waiter object, passing a reference to this for my reference PT inside in line number 16, and I'm returning this entire object. And then I have two more customization points, return value. If you follow the pattern, then you now can see return value is for core return. So whenever I say core return, return value um, gets called. Same procedure as previously, it's function overloading, it's just a function with a special name. I'm taking a std string here, putting that one in my variable msg out for my promise type, and that's it. The difference to yield value and initially suspend, for example, is that return value always returns void internally. So control always continues. Because it reaches our next customization point, and this is final suspend. So for final suspend, I once again can tell the compiler what to do. Suspend here or continue, and continue means flowing off the end of the coroutine and by that ending the coroutine, which potentially is not what you want to do if you just receive the value that somebody on the outside is waiting for. Okay. Now, the wrapper type chat I have here basically includes my promise type. And I see you read the comment, um, this is also something you shouldn't do at work, maybe at home. The disclaimer usually is don't do this at home, right? But this time it's better to not do it at work. But I think you get a picture. What I showed you on the slide before is what should be copy and pasted in here. What I'm doing for this wrapper type in A, I'm creating myself a shortcut. I need something that's a coroutine handle of my promise type. Um, because the coroutine handle promise type is a bit long for me to type all the time. I use a using ALS here, shortcutting that to handle. And then in B, I'm creating a um, variable of this type, mcoro handle here. In my constructor then, in C, that one takes a pointer to my promise type, and it uses this function from std coroutine handle from promise. So the compiler internally, you can say, maintains a list of coroutines, of active coroutines. And it knows how to convert from a promise type to a coroutine handle and vice versa. And here I'm asking, convert me the promise type to a handle to store this now inside my coroutine. So this is like a pointer to your data. And this is how you can control the coroutine. And because this is a handle, it's something that's potentially exclusive to this coroutine. And this is why in the next step, I'm making this coroutine move only, so move constructible only at this point to be precise. And by that, I'm deactivating the copy operations. So my coroutine is not copyable. And um, because I have this handle here, I'm also responsible in this case of this coroutine to destroy it. So in my destructor, I'm checking whether the handle is still valid and if so, I'm calling destroy on the coroutine handle to free it to give it up. It's like a delete, if you want. 
And then we have the two functions, listen and answer. So listen here first checks whether the coroutine is done or not. And if not, the coroutine gets resumed and we are moving out the value from the promise type MSG out. So because of the coroutine handle, I can access the promise type. And because I know what's in this promise type and because I didn't really use getters and setters, I directly access the member variable MSG out here and move that out of the coroutine, out of my promise type, whenever I call listen. And then in answer, it's the other way around. I put in a std string into the coroutine by using the coroutine's handles promise type, and they are the member variable MSG in. And I'm once again checking whether the coroutine is done or not, and if it's not already done, I'm resuming it. Remember, you should not resume uh, already finished done coroutine. This is why this check is here. If you put all this in a picture, we can say from the left to the right, we have user code. Everything starts with user code. So the coroutine as I presented you, um, we are created with fun and then call, chat, and, and uh, listen and answer. This is my user code. There I have this rapid type chat. And that one now we know contains a promise type. And whether this promise type now contains more members, like in my case, MSG in and MSG out, this is our implementation. Okay, it's, it's optional to the compiler. That my rep type chat here contains member functions like listen and answer, it's optional. That I store a coroutine handle in my rep type is optional. Depending on the coroutine I want, I need it or I don't, but for the compiler, it's optional. The coroutine handle now and my initial implementation, which contained co-yield, co-weight, and co-return, that one gets transformed to a compiler implementation. So every call to the three keywords got rewritten to a call to the dedicated promise type of this coroutine. And also the compiler tracks out all the local variables and the parameters to this coroutine and puts it onto the coroutine frame. Okay, so they're not ending up on the regular stack. And this is basically why it can be resumed because, well, it's stack that's always there if you want it or always preserved for this coroutine. So this is the transformation. That means um, coroutines are also to one part a heavy transformation by the compiler. Okay, but we have nice syntax to write there. All right, a few definitions. For the rest of the talk, I will declare a task as a coroutine that does a job without returning a value. I will refer to a generator as a coroutine that does a job and that returns a value, either by coroutine or co yield. And I promised you, I will show you the helper types, initial suspend, um, sorry, co wait, ah, suspend always and suspend never. Here we have them. Um, the only difference between the two is what the wait ready here returns. So you can see the two of them are structs with the three member functions, the wait ready, the wait suspend, the wait resume, as we just saw it. Um, two slides ago, and the only difference basically is whether the wait ready returns false or true. These are types that we have in the standard library to easily signal what this um, co yield, co return will, will do at this point. All right, are you ready for more coroutines at this point? Perfect. I mean, that's why you're here, right? So another task for a coroutine, interleaving two std vectors. What I mean by that is, say I have two std vectors A and B with a couple of integer values in them, and the resulting output should be one element of A, one element of B, one element of A, one element of B, and so forth. So interleaved.
I have this coroutine interleaved here. It takes two vectors of int by copy, and it returns a generator type. So, because if you start looking into this thing, you can see a core yield, so it's obviously a coroutine. We once again know generator here contains a promise type. Sorry? Why am I using copy for the vector? Um, that's a very good question. So the question was um, why I'm using um, copies for my stu two stood vectors, the parameters A and B, instead of potentially references, const references. Yeah, const references is the usual thing we go for. Um, not in coroutines, please. Remember, um, everything that we use inside a coroutine ends up on the coroutine frame. Okay? Everything. Local parameters and variables. Parameters also end up on the coroutine frame. Now you can have two ways, and one of them would make um, your code perfectly work. Once we have a std vector declared outside of our coroutine and let our coroutine take a const reference to that std vector, everything would be nice and fine. Once we start passing a temporary object, which is now possible to this coroutine because it takes a const reference, we usually try to entertain lifetime extension. So the lifetime extension we get is that our std vector our temporary object lives for the lifetime of this function. But this time we have a coroutine. And that means that the lifetime of a temporary object, which a const reference could catch, lives basically, depending on the coroutine, until you hit initial suspend or you leave the coroutine for the first time. So you, you have a potential of um, having a dangling reference here. This is why I usually don't use um, const references in this case. But there are plenty of options when it is safe. It's just the one that makes it bad. Okay, but it's a good question. Yeah, maybe let's do that. Um, all right. If you look into the coroutine now, then we can see lambdas can be coroutines as well. Because in line number three there, I have a lambda. This lambda takes a std vector, this time by um, reference, and it returns a generator. The same thing that my coroutine interleaved returns. The lambda internally simply is a range-based for loop that loops over the std vector and co yields each value. Okay, it's just a nice wrapper around the range based for loop that yields a value at the time. In line seven and eight, I'm creating two new variables, x and epsilon, by invoking the lambda once with a and once with b. So this is setting up the coroutine two times. And now we don't know the type generator yet but we can see it seems to come with a member function finished. So in line number 10, you can see another pattern that comes off on these coroutines that we have these infinite loops, which are unusual for the software parts. So here I'm, I'm looping and I'm asking whether x is not finished or epsilon is not finished. And if one of them returns, yes, we are not finished yet, then we are going into this while loop. And there I'm checking individually again, is x not finished? Yes, okay, then I'm co-yielding a value from x by calling co-yield x.value, and then I'm calling x.resume. Or I'm doing the same thing for epsilon after that. So this is how I'm practically interleaving the values here. Okay, and it could also handle unbalanced vectors. So if one has more elements than the other, then that one would kick in at the end. It's possible. Any questions so far? All right, perfect. So if you then start looking at the promise type here, then we can see I have this promise type this time. I'm storing an int 
um, in form of value here or val. And get return object returns a generator object, the same pattern as before. I'm passing a this pointer to the constructor of generator. I have the customization points, initial suspend, final suspend, and yield value. This time, initial suspend says never, because I immediately want to track out the value of my std vector. Okay? So I directly let a coroutine start its work here. Final suspend says as before always, yield value also says always, and it takes an integer and stores that in its internal um, member value. Return void here does what it says, nothing, and unhandled exception also does nothing. My um, generator type here looks like this. I once again do this shortcut for handle. I have a member mcuro handle storing the coroutines handle. My constructor here takes a promise type um, pointer, gets the coroutine handle from the promise type. It's move only. It cares in its destructor for destroying the coroutine if it's still valid. In line number 14, function value here reaches via the coroutine handles promise type to the member val there. And finished here is just a bit of sugar for um, calling done on the coroutine handle. And resume uses finished, and if that's not true, it invokes the coroutine again by calling resume. Okay, so this is a slight variation of the previous coroutine, and this potentially starts showing why coroutines are that complex in C++, because you can model that many things with them. If we look at the using side, um, then we can say, okay, we have these two stood vectors A and B here. I create my generated G by calling my coroutine interleave, moving the two stood vectors A and B into the coroutine, and then I'm calling or having a by loop here, which um, checks with not finished here, and if that's the case, it goes into the body and tracks a value out of the coroutine, and then it resumes it again. So this is basically the same that our lambda did in the inside, we are doing now in the outside. And this is how you can interleave two stood vectors very easily, if you ignore the part that you have to write a lot of customization code in the background, right? Um, but it's just that slide, it's, it's beautiful. Actually, no, it, it, it's not beautiful, right? Um, I mean, Let's, let's think about another task. I would say a plastic surgeon is required, and um, well, it's more a developer-like surgeon than, than a real um, human surgeon, because I'm, I'm very sure um, we all would like to use a range-based full loop instead of that while loop there, right? And every user has to know what it was finished, resumed, or I forgot. So who wants to know all that? So let's do that. What is missing? Well, what's missing is we need an iterator. And for that, we need something that fulfills the iterator concept. That means it must be equal, comparable, incrementable, and dereferenceable. So if it depends what we want to do. We can go for a generic type, but I said I'm leaving templates out. So assume the type you're seeing here on the right is inside generator. It's declared inside generator. The first thing I'm doing in line number one, I'm declaring an empty struct called Sentinel. Once again, for argument-based lookup later. And then I'm declaring the iterator. That one stores a coroutine handle, and it implements the equals equals operator. And that one takes a Sentinel object by value. So this is once again simply to invoke this equals operator, because my coroutine itself it knows everything it needs to know. It doesn't need a right-hand side to compare it to. It, it checks whether it's done or not. That, that's all it needs. So we need to sentinel um, type here simply to invoke this equals equals operator. And um, I'm going with the positive side. So usually it's the not equal um, that a compiler checks for. But since C++20, it's, it's able to rewrite that. So I, I can write equals equals instead of the negative part. So I like that. And then we have the 
um, pre-increment operator here in lineup 11. That one simply resumes my core routine and returns a reference to this. And then finally, we have the dereference or the star operator here, which calls or returns the value inside my promise type. So this is the iterator part um, we need. And the last thing we then need is to say, okay, my generator itself comes with the two member functions begin and end, while begin returns the iterator type and returns the sentinel type. And now I can write or use the coroutine. As you can see at the bottom of the slide on the right, I have my two vectors as before. I create a coroutine within the leaf as before, but now I simply have to use a range-based for loop, looping over that, and I get the interleaved values of the two vectors. Okay, so this is how we can beautify coroutines for your users. And this is why I initially said it's it's optional. You can also go the other way around, but I would prefer that way. Right? So this is interleaving two stood vectors. The not so nice and nicer part. What else can we do? Well, we can do another task, and this is scheduling multiple tasks. It's interesting, right? And that brings us to the question, um, what's cooperative and what's preemptive multitasking? So um, with preemptive multitasking, the thread has no control for when it runs, on which CPU, or for how long it runs. Sounds a little bit odd that you do not have control of everything, and we use that pattern so often, um, but it works quite well. That's why we use it. Cooperative multitasking, that means the thread decides for how long it runs and when it's time to give control to another thread, which indeed is also very difficult because who wants to give up control, right? So this is why the other way often is um, better. With coroutines, we can implement cooperative multitasking. And that means instead of using locks like in preemptive multitasking to secure our data, we can simply say co-yield or co-wait to give up control because we know once we don't do that, no other task runs. Okay, so this is why we can go lock-free there if you want. So what I wanted to build is something like this, um, scheduling multiple tasks. I have something that's called a scheduler. And I have two tasks, task A and B. I pass the scheduler to them when I create them, and then I have this while loop which calls schedule on my scheduler. Okay, so this is what I want in the end. For my task, I go simple. I have a task A and a task B, and guess what? The only difference between the two is the one put, prints out hello from task A, while the other says hello from task B, and so forth. So the only difference between them is whether they say A or B. Both of them say hello from task A, then suspend, then say A is going back to work, and then suspend again, and then A is back to more work. Okay, But we have two tasks. You can let them do anything you want, um, receiving data from the internet, waiting for data from a local file, things like that. This is my scheduler. My scheduler here internally uses a std list of coroutine handles. And because I'm not necessarily interested in a specific coroutine, I'm using a void coroutine handle here. So this coroutine handle knows it's, it's a coroutine and it knows to what to refer to, but I don't have the exact type because I don't need it. So this list here is called tasks. And then I have this function schedule. Schedule takes the um, front element from my list, checks then whether this task, aka coroutine, is done. If not, it gets resumed. And in the end, in line number 11, the return value of schedule is whether the list tasks is empty. So are there more tasks to schedule or not? So this is my schedule function. And then I have suspend. Suspend internally declares a awaiter struct. 
And this time I'm showing you another different flavor I'm deriving from suspend always. Why? Because I only need to override await suspend. And it signals a little bit nicer what this awaiter will do. It will suspend always. And um, I'm storing a reference to my scheduler here. And because I used this inheritance here, I also have to write a constructor, which defeats the purpose of writing um, less code, but I wanted to show you a, a variation here. So my constructor here simply takes the scheduler by reference, stores that internally, and now my await suspend customization point, that one for the first time is interested in the parameter, the coroutine handle that gets passed to it. Because it uses the coroutine handle to push it back to the task list of my scheduler. Okay, and this is the first time I'm, I'm doing that. I'm interested in the coroutine handle here. And then, as before, await suspend here returns a fresh awaiter object by um, dereferencing this upon creation. So this is the scheduler part. And here is the rest of the customization points. This time, I would say it's not that much. I have this type task. So this is my wrapper type. I need that. But there's nothing in I care for this time. So nothing I, I want to pass in, pass out, do anything. So all I say is I have this wrapper type. And the, internally, there's the promise type. This is the requirement. My promise type has a git return object, as always. It simply default constructs a task object. I'm not interested in that at all. Initial suspend says never. Final suspend, this time, says suspend never. I have a return void here, which does nothing, and unhandled exception doesn't do anything at all as well. But this here now gives me what I want. I now can schedule different tasks, okay? With this um, customization points, I'm doing well enough for this part. What if I want to do it differently? Instead of passing the scheduler to my tasks on creation as a parameter, maybe scheduler is a global object and I don't need to pass that to tasks. So I want to write code like the one you're seeing here. So I'm simply creating a task A and a task B, and then I'm invoking gscheduler.schedule. This changes the implementation of my two tasks, task A and B, slightly. So I'm saying co-wait here on a suspend type. So I'm creating a new object suspend here instead of reaching for scheduler because I don't have the scheduler object. It changes also the implementation of scheduler. It still stores a list of coroutine handles. The function suspend here takes a coroutine handle and pushes back this coroutine to the task list. Schedule is, as before, gets one element from the task list, checks whether the coroutine is resumable, if so gets resume, and it returns whether the task list is empty or not. I now at some point need a global scheduler object, and I need this new type, suspend. And suspend now comes with a new operator, the core weight operator. This is something that coroutines added as well. So the suspend struct here has this core weight operator, and its purpose is once again to return something like suspend never, suspend always. So I'm creating another waiter type here that says suspend always. It's again interested in the coroutine handle because it feeds that one into the scheduler suspend function, essentially putting it at the end of the task list. And then such a waiter struct or object gets returned from coroutine. So this is just another flavor of implementing this scheduler here. And, well. It depends on what you prefer, global, 
scheduler object or the other way around. Okay. So far so good. What about another thing? Parsing data. I've done that for a large part of my life. This is um, from one of Andrew Tenenbaum's book, Potentially Networking. Um, I want to implement something like a byte stream parser. In the end, I will parse out a string, but imagine it could be bytes. The protocol is the following. I have something like an escape character, H, in my case, um, that signals a special byte a command in the stream. And then I have something like SOF, a start of frame, or also end of frame, that comes with the hexadecimal value um, 0x10. It marks the start of a frame. So that means escape plus start of frame together mark the start of a frame. Of course, we have to um, mark them somewhat special. And if H, the character H, should occur in the byte stream, we need to escape it it would mean an escape character. So basically we have escape escape, that means we have a real letter H. The protocol or the implementation in the graph here is shown. So first I'm in wait for start. So I'm looking until I'm seeing escape. That means I'm now looking for start of frame. And if that one's found, that means I'm processing the message. So any byte that comes in is part of the message until I'm seeing escape again. And now the question is, is this a stuffed byte? So that means we are looking at the letter H. Then it means I have to see escape again, so I can continue processing the message. And if not, that means um, the next thing I have to see is start a frame again. It means my frame is completed. I'm returning the frame to the caller and continue processing the data stream. So this is roughly the protocol. I think I implemented something like that dozens of times. This is possibly the ugliest implementation, um, but it fits on a slide and it mimics what I want to talk about. So this is my function process next byte. It receives a byte and it has something called a complete callback frame completed. Internally, it does some ugly things, like having a couple of static variables, some where it declares a std string frame, and a couple of bools, like in header was escape looking for start of frame. So this is obviously maintenance of state inside this function. And there are different ways how you can play this. Um, this is obviously a very limited version because it means I can use it, this um, process next byte thing only with one data stream because of the static variables in there. So this is not what we really want for um, production code. I think there are at least two different ways. The one, the other one would be saying, okay, we are putting all these static variables here in a struct and pass that one in by reference as a parameter. But that means that the caller now is responsible for maintaining the state here, which is a little bit odd, at least in my view. The other way we often go for is say, hey, let's create a class because that one stores all that. Yeah, it's nicer for some thought, but in the end it's a class for something that's supposed to be a function, right? So this way, gone for the function here, because this is all it should be. Now, if you read this code, um, and I can judge it because it's mine, it's very hard to read. So if you try to spot in which state this process next byte currently is, it's quite hard. And it's not getting that much better whether you're making it a, a function that gets the, the state as a parameter or um, moving it to a function. You can also apply something like the state pattern. It um, doesn't get much nicer. What I want is an easy translation for the diagram I just showed you. So this. Okay. I have this function parse that has this while true loop here. 
the first thing it does inside is it cool waits for the next byte. And then it declares or creates this std string frame here and it checks whether the currently received byte is not equal to escape. And if not, it simply says continue. So we are back at the beginning. Just like the diagram showed. Next thing in A here is I'm cool waiting for the next byte. And I'm checking whether this is start of frame. And if not, I'm continuing. Continue here means, of course, going back to the beginning. Because it's not what I was looking for. But if it was escape and start of frame, like in the diagram, I go into the while loop in the second one, which processes the data because I know I'm now in the data stream. So I'm co-waiting for the next byte in, in B here in line number 13, and I'm checking once again, is it escape? If so, we know it's either a stuffed H character or we are out of sync, or it could be um, end of frame. So I'm awaiting the next byte, checking whether it's start of frame. If so, perfect, we received an entire frame. So I'm co-yielding the frame. And I'm breaking out of this loop means I'm going back to the outer while loop and the R2 to begin. Otherwise, should it not be an escape character, we are out of sync. I'm simply breaking out here, throwing away this entire frame. Might not be the best implementation, maybe you want to signal this error, but it's one way to go. And in all other cases, in this inner while loop, I add every character I receive to the std string frame. I would argue that this implementation is highly readable and very easy to see in which state you're on. And this is why I think coroutines um, are so great for these parsers, because you can there really focus on the parsing aspect and what's going on and you see where you are. Because speaking for myself only, I think I haven't written a parser yet that worked the first time. So I had to debug all of them multiple times. So knowing in which state they are or in which state they're supposed to be is very vital for me. So I like that. Let's look at the promise type we need for that. Um, I decided here to say my promise type stores two members, a std string m value and a std optional of type std byte, m last byte. My get return object here returns a generator object, as before, pass it to this pointer to the constructor here. Yield value takes a std string, moves that one into m value internally and suspends always. A weight transform here for the core weight takes a std byte to be dispatched. It creates this waiter struct once again, storing a std optional of byte reference and recent byte here, and it declares the three members await ready, await suspend, await resume. Await ready here checks whether m recent bytes on my optional has a value. Suspend, await suspend. This nothing and the wait resume here exchanges the recent byte with null opt, so tracking the value out of the optional and returning the um, byte at this point. You can guard this more, but I um, was more thinking like let it crash if the optional should be empty here. A wait transform then returns the awaiter. It also declares initial suspend and final suspend both with suspend always. It has a return void, which does nothing as well as unhandled exception. So this is the promise type we need for that. And my generator itself here, I do something differently. I provide the parents operator or call operator here in line number four, simply to make it nicer for users. I now can simply call this thing. And internally, it does a std exchange with my promise types and value with um, an empty state. It comes with a member function send data, which takes a byte, stores that one in my promise types m last byte variable or member variable, and then it does the usual checking whether the coroutine is already done, and if not, it gets resumed. This coroutine, as all previous ones, is move only. It 
thus destroy the coroutine handle in the destructor or the coroutine by its handle. And, well, the constructor takes the promise type by pointer, drags a handle from it. If you now want to use this, I can say, okay, I have this process stream function. That one here takes a std vector of bytes by reference and a generator by reference, calling that one parse. I have a range-based for loop here that loops over the std vector, so my supposed stream of, of bytes, my um, network data stream. And for each byte I'm receiving, I'm calling parse.sendData, so I'm sending this byte into the coroutine. And after that, I'm checking by invoking parse with the parents operator, did I receive a std string that comes with a length? So do I have something received from the coroutine? If so, I call handle frame, pass the result to it, and otherwise, I give it another try. You can go more fancy here, I would say, you can also return a std optional or so that you do not have to check for the length, but this is the implementation I have here. Down then, I declare fake bytes one. There's a couple of bytes, the characters I need to get a message started. If you read it, you can see it contains the string hello, and fake bytes two contains the rest that says world. With a couple of extra characters that get parsed away. So in C here, I'm creating my coroutine parse by invoking parse. And then I'm calling process stream, passing my std vector with a couple of bytes and my parsing coroutine p. And I wanted to demonstrate here this parse stream now that can run out of data, but I can continue with it later because my coroutine is still there. So with fake bytes too, now I'm once again calling parse stream just with another set of values but with the same coroutine, because this coroutine knows where it left off. So if your data stream should get shut down or interrupted by any way, this coroutine will still try to get in sync, look for an escape and start a frame, and then continue parsing. So very nice, very easy here at this point. All right, so far we basically looked at a very happy path. That means we ignored exceptions, right? Yeah, not totally, I mean, I provided unhandled exception, but didn't do anything. So what can you do and what are your consequences? Only looking at the, at the happy path is, of course, something very nice. The customization points allow us to control the behavior here once again. Um, there are two different stages in a coroutine where an exception can occur. So first of all, during the coroutine setup, so when the promise type and generator are created. And um, things that can happen there is, for example, when um, the compiler or the code at runtime tries to allocate the promise type, you can run into an out-of-memory situation. So this is something that can happen. That means your core team was never able to run. And um, the second thing is, after the core team was set up and did run or is about to run for us. So these are two essentially different things because the third wo first one means the core team was never alive. The second one means the core team already was alive and, and did something or is about to do something. Option number one, nice and easy, let it crash, okay? All you do is say, unheld exception, nothing. That means the default handler of the coroutine will shut the coroutine down by calling final suspend, and the program will terminate afterwards by invoking std to terminate. So this is, if you, well, don't care, don't have any interest, don't have anything better than just let it crash, let it do that. Option number two would be, 
what I call a controlled termination. You can say, okay, in an unhandled exception, I lock this error, I lock this condition, and maybe then I'm calling to terminate myself to ensure a very quick um, shutdown. I can also call a board. If I have, per my domain, specific functions I have to call instead of terminate or something, I can do that here. Okay, so this is another way of freedom, especially for embedded um, domains, that's often great. So this is adding more information to the crash or to the exceptional situation. And the third option is you can re-throw the exception. Of course, you can also do option number two and lock the thing. But the main part of option number three is you simply say throw an unhandled exception. And by that, you're re-throwing the exception. And that means you're propagating it outside of the coroutine. So if I would modify my initial coroutine chat in a very, very silly way by saying all it does is it throws an int with the value 42, nothing else, that means it practically always throws. And if I would use that one, then I now can build a try catch block around the creation of the coroutine and then the call to chat.listen. And I can catch this exception. So if you see any way that this helps, which I can see, um, then re-throwing is a way because now you can, you can propagate the value out of the coroutine. What you should be careful with here now is once a coroutine encountered an exception internally, if you catch it, so the code I wrote, I intentionally wrote that way. So I put the object chat inside the try catch block. You can also put chat the object before the try catch block because you potentially only want to catch the exception that happens once you call listen. Well, that opens the scope that somebody then says, oh yeah, the exception was called, perfect. So now let's use chat again. But chat just had an exception. You cannot recover from that. So be aware of that. If your coroutine encounters an exception, it's gone. Okay, all you can do is handle this exception, do something about it, maybe start over, but not use the coroutine again. You have to do it um, fresh from a fresh start. So this is something that, that can fool you where you think, oh, well, I handled that one, it's fine. The coroutine on the inside doesn't know whether you handled it and you do not handle it for the internals anyway. So it's just letting the entire program continue as opposed to your entire program crashes because the coroutine crashed. When it comes to coroutines, there are a few restrictions or limitations. Const expert functions and in C20 const eval functions cannot be coroutines. So there are no coroutines at compile time at the moment. Constructors and destructors cannot be coroutines. It would be funny having a coroutine destructor, right? It runs partially, then it stops, then it continues, then it stops. Not sure what it would do. So that's not possible. Neither is the other way around, constructing the object, but only partially. Um, functions using bar arcs, and I'm talking about the C bar arcs here, okay? Like printf, the one that plays via the stack, your parameters, they cannot be coroutines. Variadic function templates, for example, they work because in the end the compiler knows the exact number of parameters there. Functions um, with plain order as return types or concept types cannot be coroutines. If you use a trailing return type, that one would work. Inside a coroutine, you always must either say coreturn or co yield. You cannot say return. There was a very, very longish discussion whether we should really add the co underscore in front of it. And um, we decided we have to do that, knowing that other languages do it differently. But to distinguish it, it was necessary. And last but not least, main cannot be a coroutine. Okay, that's also not possible. I showed you in this talk, lambdas, on the other hand, can be coroutines, which can be very handy. That's a very nice thing. So coroutines are more or less first-class citizens now in C++20 or more C++23. 
All right, wonderful. A lot of coroutines. So, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed the extended version of it. Um, before I yeah, hand the floor to you for questions, all that's left for me to say is I am Fertig. Thank you. Thank you.